should you run away? And how can you resist right then? After all, you'll only make your situation worse. You'll arrest 13. Make it more difficult for them to sort out the mistake. And it isn't just that you don't put up any resistance. You even walk down the stairs on tiptoe, as you were ordered to do, so your neighbors won't hear point six at what exact point, then, should one resist. When one's belt is taken away. When one is ordered to face into a corner. When one crosses the threshold of one's home. An arrest consists of a series of incidental irrelevancies of a multitude of things that do not matter, and there seems no point in arguing about any one of them individually especially at a time when the thoughts of the person arrested are wrapped tightly about the big question, what for, and yet all these incidental irrelevancies taken together implacably constitute the arrest. Almost anything can occupy the thoughts of a person who has just been arrested. This alone would fill volumes. There can be feelings which we never suspected. When 19-year-old S. and how we burned in the camps later, thinking, what would things have been like if every security operative, when he went out at night to make an arrest, had been uncertain whether he would return alive and had to say, goodbye to his family, or if, during periods of mass arrests, as for example, in Leningrad, when they arrested a quarter of the entire city, people had not simply sat there in their lairs, hailing with terror at every bang of the downstairs door and at every step on the staircase, but had understood they had nothing left to lose and had boldly set up in the downstairs hall an ambush of half a dozen people with axes, hammers, pokers, or whatever else was at hand. After all, you knew ahead of time that those blue caps were out at night for no good purpose, and you could be sure ahead of time that you'd be cracking the skull of a cutthroat. Or what about the Black Maria sitting out there on the street with one lonely chauffeur what if it had been driven off or its tires spiked? The organs would very quickly have suffered a shortage of officers and transport and, notwithstanding all of Stalin's thirst, the cursed machine would have ground to a halt. H. If. We didn't love freedom enough. And even more we had no awareness of the real situation. We spent ourselves in one unrestrained outburst. In 1917, and then we hurried to submit. We submitted with pleasure. Arthur Ransom describes a workers' meeting in Yaroslavl in 1921. Delegates were sent to the workers from the Central Committee in Moscow to confer on the substance of the argument about trade unions. The representative of the AFO, Sishin, Y. Lauren, explained to the workers that their trade union must be their defense against the administration, that they possessed rights which they had one and upon which no one else had any right to infringe. The workers, how, ever, were completely indifferent, simply not comprehending whom they still needed to be defended against and why they still needed any rights. When the spokesman for the party line rebuked them for their laziness and forgetting out of hand, and demanded sacrifices from them overtime work without pay. Reductions in food, military discipline in the factory administration this aroused great elation and applause. We purely and simply deserved everything. That happened afterward. 14. I. 
the Gulag Archipelago. Yevgenia Duyarenko was arrested in 1921 and three young Czechists were poking about her bed and through the underwear in her chest of drawers, she was not disturbed. There was nothing there, and they would find nothing. But all of a sudden they touched her personal diary, which she would not have shown even to her own mother. And these hostile young strangers reading the words she had written was more devastating to her than the whole Lubyanka with its bars and its cellars. It is true of many that the outrage inflicted by arrest on their personal feelings and attachments can be far, far stronger than their political beliefs or their fear of prison. A person who is not inwardly prepared for the use of violence against him is always weaker than the person committing the violence. There are a few bright and daring individuals who understand instantly. Grigoryev, the director of the Geological Institute of the Academy of Sciences, barricaded himself inside and spent two hours burning up his papers when they came to arrest him in 1948. Sometimes the principal emotion of the person arrested is relief and even happiness. This is another aspect of human nature. It happened before the revolution too. The Yekaterinodar schoolteacher Serdyukova, involved in the case of Alexander Lulyanov, felt only relief when she was arrested. But this feeling was a thousand times stronger during epidemics of arrests when all around you they were hauling in people like yourself and still had not come for you, for some reason they were taking their time. After all, that kind of exhaustion, that kind of suffering, is worse than any kind of arrest, and not only for a person of limited power. Age. Vasily Vlasov, a fearless communist, whom we shall recall more than once later on, renounced the idea of escape proposed by his non-party assistants, and pined away because the entire leadership of the Katy district was arrested in 1937, and they kept delaying and delaying his own arrest. He could only endure the blow head-on. He did endure it, and then he relaxed, and during the first days after his arrest he felt marvelous. In 1934 the priest father Irakli went to al Maada to visit some believers in exile there. During his absence they came three times to his Moscow apartment to arrest him. When he returned, members of his flock met him at the station and refused to let him go home. Arrest I-15 and for eight years hid him in one apartment after another. The priest suffered so painfully from this harried life that when he was finally arrested in 1942 he sang hymns of praise to God. In this chapter we are speaking only of the masses, the helpless rabbits arrested for no one knows what reason. But in this book we will also have to touch on those who in post-revolutionary times remained genuinely political. Vera Rybakova, a social democratic student, dreamed when she was in freedom of being in the detention center in Seussel. Only there did she hope to encounter her old comrades for there were none of any left in freedom. And only there could she work out her wad outlook. The socialist revolutionary the SR Yekaterina Olitskaya didn't consider herself worthy of being imprisoned in 1924. After all, Russia's best people had served time and she was still young and had not yet done any tilde G for Russia. But freedom itself was expelling her. And so both of them went to prison with pride and happiness. Resistance why didn't you resist? Today those who have continued to live on in comfort scold those who suffered. Yes, resistance should have begun right there, at the moment of the arrest itself. But it did not begin. And so they are leading you. 
During a daylight arrest there is always that brief and unique moment when they are leading you, either inconspicuously, on the basis of a cowardly deal you have made, or else quite openly, their pistols unholstered, through a crowd of hundreds of just such doomed innocents as yourself. You aren't gagged. You really can and you really ought to cry out to cry out that you are being arrested. That villains in disguise are trapping people. That arrests are being made on the strength of false denunciations. That millions are being subjected to silent reprisals. If many such outcries had been heard all over the city in the course of a day, would not our fellow citizens perhaps have begun to bristle? And would arrests perhaps no longer have been so easy? In 1927, when submissiveness had not yet softened our brains to such a degree, two Czechists tried to arrest a woman on Serpikov Square during the day. She grabbed hold of the stanchion of 16. I. The Gulag Archipelago. A street lamp and began to scream, refusing to submit. A crowd gathered. There had to have been that kind of woman, there had to have been that kind of crowd too. Passers-by didn't all just close their eyes and hurry by. The quick young men immediately became flustered. They can't work in the public eye. They got into their car and fled. Right then and there she should have gone to a railroad station and left. But she went home to spend the night. And during the night they took her off to the Lubyanka. Instead, not one sound comes from your parched lips, and that passing crowd naively believes that you and your executioners are friends out for a stroll. I myself often had the chance to cry out. On the eleventh day after my arrest, three smirch bums, more burdened by four suitcases full of war booty than by me they had come to rely on me in the course of the long trip brought me to the Bielorussian station in Moscow. They were called a special convoy in other words, a special escort guard. But in actual fact their automatic pistols only interfered with their dragging along the four terribly heavy bags of loot they and their chiefs in Smirsch counterintelligence on the second Bielorussian front had plundered in Germany and were now bringing to their families in the fatherland under the pretext of convoying me. I myself lugged a fifth suitcase with no great joy since it contained my diaries and literary works, which were being used as evidence against me. Not one of the three knew the city, and it was up to me to pick the shortest route to the prison. I had personally to conduct them to the Lubyanka, where they had never been before, and which, in fact, I confused with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I had spent one day in the counterintelligence prison at Army Headquarters and three days in the counterintelligence prison at the headquarters of the front, where my cellmates had educated me in the deceptions practiced by the interrogators, their threats and beatings, in the fact that once a person was arrested he was never released, and in the inevitability of a tenor, a ten-year sentence, and then by a miracle I had suddenly burst out of there and for four days had traveled like a free person among free people, even though my flanks had already lain on rotten straw. Arrest I-17 beside the latrine bucket, my eyes had already beheld beaten up and sleepless men, my ears had heard the truth, and my mouth had tasted prison gruel. So why did I keep silent? Why, in my last minute out in the open, did I not attempt to enlighten the hoodwinked crowd? I kept silent, too, in the Polish city of Brodnica but maybe they didn't understand Russian there. I didn't call out one word on the streets of Bialystok but maybe it wasn't a matter that concerned the Poles. 
I didn't utter a sound at the Volkabyst station but there were very few people.